Just know that, you know, for all of you Winx Club fans out there who feel like this whole thing is just a complete bastardization of the, <laughs> <laughs> the characters in the story you love, just know that, you know, the creators that um, have been tasked with reinventing this property um, really do love it. Hey there, welcome to the Winx Forever podcast. I'm Lola, creator, host, and lifelong Winx fan. I'm taking a deep dive into the very cool universe of Winx Club. So whether you've been a Winx fan since 2004, like myself, or you vaguely remember it from your childhood, or even if you're being introduced to it for the first time, I want to say welcome. This is the Winx Forever podcast. <laughs> Hello, fairy friends. Welcome back to the Winks Forever podcast. I am your host, Lola Valentine. As we all know and have been dealing with over the past two years, um, <laughs> our beloved Faith the Wink saga came to a halting stop uh, when Netflix did not renew it for a third season, leaving us on many, many cliffhangers. Um, but as some of us know, and you know, maybe some of us don't know, um, it actually has been, the story has been picked up by uh, Maverick Comics. They are doing a, a revival of it, kind of um, going to, you know, like give us a proper ending to the Netflix Fate the Wink saga. And so joining me today to talk about it is actually the author of these graphic novels. We have Olivia Cortero Briggs. I'm really excited to dive in. So uh, Olivia, welcome to the show. Thank you. I want to give you know our audience a chance to get to know you and your professional history a little bit. Um, so I want to just dive into uh, your background with writing and what got you uh, started writing. Um. Well, interestingly, and, and this sounds a little bit like I'm blowing smoke up my own butt, but uh, I've kind of been a storyteller since I, I knew how. Um, and I say that because, you know, even before I could really write, because um, I didn't, you know, fully have a grasp of the English language in third grade, I had this wonderful teacher who allowed me to <laughs> have all the classmates sit down and I would kind of stand in the middle and tell these stories. And most of them were scary stories. I My, my first love was horror. Um, and uh, because I seemed to handle it pretty well, my parents would let me watch um, some pretty scary movies growing up. Yeah. And that informed a lot of these stories that I would tell. And so I, I knew that I liked a captive audience. I knew that I liked telling stories. I think for a long time, the assumption for me was, because my father was a set and lighting designer in the theater in New York City. Nice. And so, um, you know, I'm surrounded by thespians all the time. But in the world of theater, you know, most of the writers are either really famous or they're dead, right? So they're not really accessible. <laughs> And so I guess I grew up thinking that, you know, acting was the career and writing was the hobby since I kind of mm -hmm. couldn't help but do it. I was always writing stories. Um, and then, of course, you know, the older I got <laughs> and, you know, I came to Los Angeles and I was auditioning a bunch, but I, you know, I, I didn't like waiting around for a job. So I ended up jumping behind camera and working camera yeah. department and working my way up to first AD on, you know, very low budget uh feature film sets with overly ambitious uh, producers and directors and being a hate sponge on mm -hmm. a set like that, um, because that's pretty, that's a large portion of the first AD's job. Not only are you running the entire set, but you, you basically keep the hate from reaching the director. <laughs> so you have to absorb it all from a very angry underpaid crew mm -hmm. um, for m about a month at a time. It, it was a lot and I kind of started tapping out. And then I got this award randomly. I had won best screenplay at the Flint International Film Festival and awesome. I, I had applied obviously, but they hadn't even notified me that I was, you know, uh, like nominated, let alone that I had won. Um, so, you know, I gave my tearful acceptance speech to nobody in my uh, Hollywood courtyard <laughs> over on Wilcox. And that was the moment where I realized that this thing that I had been doing that no one ever had to pay me for, um, that I just couldn't stop. Maybe this was the career 
and everything oh. else was everything else. So I went back to school. I went to um, Tisch, uh, NYU Tisch School of the Arts. They had a campus in Singapore at the time, um, a very ill-fated financial endeavor on the part of NYU. And I can say that publicly because I, I'm still being forced to pay them. Um, <laughs> but, uh, and yeah, so the whole school was kind of crumbling to the ground while I was there, but the education was great. And it took me a while to admit that because I was so angry. But um, <laughs> but right around the time that I was finishing up there, um, a man named Adam Glass came out. He's uh, At the time, he was uh, the co-EP of Supernatural. Now he's running the mm -hmm. Equalizer. Yeah. And uh, I knew I wanted to get into TV at the time. And so I looked at my then husband who had come out there with me. And I said, we are going to make friends with this man. And uh, thankfully, Adam had come out with his wife. So it was like, hey, we're a couple, you're a couple, let us take you out. Yeah, and it worked. Yeah. And we made fast friends. And we stayed in touch for a year after I came back to New York City. I was writing plays at the time and, um, you know, having them produced off Broadway. And Adam came to see one of them. And then uh, about a year later, he called me and he said, I'm co show running the show Criminal Minds Beyond Borders. Do you want to be the writer's assistant? Yeah. And um, I, I had lived in LA, moved to Singapore, come back to New York. Now I was going back to LA, um, having all of my stuff shipped cross country um, with my one-year-old baby, uh, my husband and our dog. And we got an apartment in a day because someone died in it. And uh, <laughs> okay. And that was, that was how I came back to LA and got my first yeah. job in television. Now, granted, that was as a writer's assistant, but then the following year, I got my first script on television with a show called The Arrangement. Oh. Um, and then the following year, I was brought back as a staff writer. And then after that show was canceled, I, I first very arrogantly thought, okay, well, I'll just jump on another TV show. This will be easy. It's not easy. It's incredibly competitive. And I started kind of freaking out. So I called Adam and I said, hey, um, I need something help. And he said, well, I don't have anything in TV right now, but um, there's this comic book that I really want to write called Mary Shelley Monster Hunter. Do you want to do it with me? Now, I had never fancied myself a comic book writer. I'm not really sure why I, th well, I, I kind of am sure why, um, you know, growing up and I, I know I'm dating myself here, but whatever. Um, <laughs> it, the only comic books that seemed to be for me were the Archie comics. That was it. Mm -hmm. All the other comic books that were on the stands were, um, you know, they were superhero comics. And even if they featured a female, she was usually so, um, I'm trying to find a more elegant way to express <laughs> this, but like I said, I'm sick and feverish, so it's, I'm just going to be blunt. But they were so like sexed up that I was like, this yes. is not for me. Like, like boobs all over the place, mm -hmm. and they're wearing like whispers of clothing, and and yet they're like battling like this. Like I, yeah. I couldn't wrap my head around the fact. Like you would get so injured, you're so exposed. Why do these men they get these full body suits that like do all these tricks, and yet women are supposed to fight naked? It's just it, yeah. It, it's uh it's it doesn't make any sense these women look ridiculous mm. anyway so i um i felt like comic books was a very male dominated genre it still mm. is yeah. i'm sorry i shouldn't call it a genre i should call it a medium um so i i never thought of myself as being a comic book writer and it, so much so that like there was a character that i wrote in this play and I wanted him to be a writer, but I wanted to make him really far from myself, right? Not So I didn't want to make him a dramatic writer. I made him a comic book writer. And then life imitates art, right? <laughs> so Adam and I did Mary Shelley Monster Hunter together. And so I got to learn the format from someone who had been doing it for, mm. I, I don't even know how many years, but I do know it was over 100 comics. So that was a real gift. And I was yeah. hooked. And I thought... You know, this is a place, film and TV are, are amazing. The entertainment industry is an amazing place to be a professional. I, I think a, a lot of it is because you can actually make money in it. <laughs> but <laughs> it's because there's a lot of money in the business, there's a lot of limitations in terms of where your creativity can go. And you often have to think about budgets and producibility. Um, but in comics, obviously, you don't. Um, you can really just let your imagination run wild. And as long as you're able to find 
you know, um, publishers and, you know, even if you self-publish, as long as you're able to find your an, an audience that will go on that trip with you, yeah. um, you can do whatever you want. And it's as a, as a creator and someone who's been doing this for like, I don't even want to tell you because again, dating myself, but um, it's such a tremendous gift. So I stuck with it. So then um, when this particular project came along, yeah. um, the Wings Project, this was the first time that a company had brought a piece of, you know, licensed intellectual property to me wow. to say, you know, what, what can you do with this? Are you interested? And um, I, I'm a little embarrassed because I, I, I knew obviously that, you know, there's there's uh, Faith the Wing Saga, the TV show, which is a basically Riverdaling of Wings yep. Club. Yep. And um, I knew that all this existed. I, I knew how long it had been around. I did not know how large and um, it truly engaged the fan base is. <laughs> Yeah. So now I find myself in a state of perpetual terror waiting for my book to come out <laughs> because I am so scared that everyone is going to hate it. Oh, um, no. And I, it's funny, I've never really had this fear before oh, because, no. I, you know, at, at, at this point, most of my books, you know, they're, with, they're all um, OGNs, they're all creator owned, and they're, you know, stories that are with, you know, independent publishing houses this one is as well but um this one is really going to have some eyes on it i think when um uh maverick announced it on instagram i yeah. think that post has over seventeen thousand likes and i don't even know how many comments anymore because i stopped looking because it's all infighting yeah. between winx fans and um and there's, you know, Winx Club fans versus Faith the Winx fans. And then people who are really excited about the book and people are like, <laughs> who asked for this? And I'm like, who asked for it? The people who are telling, they're right here. Um, but anyway, so, but I mean, I, I, I say that I'm terrified. I'm also really excited too, yeah. um, for reasons that we'll talk about um, later on. But I got to meet uh, Christiane, my artist on the book. Yes. Uh, we had never met before. We got to meet in Seattle because she lives in, um, I'm in Los Angeles and she's mm -hmm. in Vancouver. So it was, nice. or well, she's just out of Vancouver, but she, that was like the one place where we, uh, was right in between the two of us. And, you know, she was saying like, oh man, you know, these, these fans really didn't like the cover. And I said, well, don't worry, just wait till they read the story. <laughs> Um, but it's, you know, it's, it's a little, of, of course, that's a total joke. We both put so much into this and I, I will say for anyone who, um, is not in love with the cover, please don't worry. The interior art is so gorgeous. Mm. And yes, it's, um, it's a more, it looks like a more youthful style than you would expect. Mm. Yeah. Um, for Faith the Wing Saga, because, you know, this book is so brooding and yeah. dark. And I think I even I also expected a more realistic style. Um, the choice was made consciously because I think, it, you know, while uh, Maverick does have the right to the characters and the material, they don't have the right to the likenesses of the actors. Right. So we had to find a way to balance that. Um, yeah. which is where Christian's work came in really handy. But also, you know, the way that she's able to capture emotion with a more, stylized, it's, it's, it's more, it is more yeah. stylized. And it, it be, but because of that, what I'm realized, because almost all of my books have been in a very realistic style. Okay. But yeah. when you, you know, start to venture out of that, um, there are ways in which you can capture emotion so much more when you're not limited by the confines of what a human face can do. Nice. Um, so uh, I really appreciated that. Also, um, you know, Christiane is queer and there's a wonderful, beautiful queer romance in the book, which was very, very dear to my heart. But when you see, I mean, yeah, what she put into these mm. scenes of the two of them um it's they're so beautiful they took my breath away and i uh, because we're, i don't know if you know but we're doing two volumes to start um at the beginning your intro it said that the purpose of these books was to give fans an ending it's not it's to give fans <laughs> a story um That's we're not we're not trying yeah we're not trying to end things we want this to Perfect. keep going right we want to funny. keep the fate the wink saga saga ing um <laughs> so uh i was thinking when i saw some of these you know beautiful illustrations for the first um 
um, the first volume while, while I was writing the second volume, I thought, okay, well, we're going to put more queer makeout scenes in the second volume because yeah. these are coming out so beautifully. So anyway, I answered your question and as, no, as per usual, <laughs> even while sick, I can still talk a blue streak. So there, there no. you go. It's awesome. It's funny that you mentioned, you know, the split between the fandom of like the the hard line of like a Faith the Wings Saga fan and then the Wings Club fans. But then there is the that that little middle Venn diagram, you know, of like people that can like hold hands with both and, and love both. And I, I you know, tend to sit in that camp uh, for sure. And as well as many of my friends, which we are really excited. And, and I mean, properties like this that just get like canned by Netflix don't get the second chance, you know? And like, we're very like fortunate as fans to get someone that, you know, has taken this story and, is treating it you know it seems with you know very much um you know respect and care as you know your team is and so i'm i'm excited for what we get to experience you know with this release I, it's so interesting to me that um you yourself came from a you know film industry background a you know a movie entertainment industry background and um i'm really curious you know writing uh screenplays versus writing um a comic or a graphic novel you know what what are some similarities that you find but also what are some uh some differences that um you've had to you know overcome honestly i feel like they're a lot more similar than they are different because nice. you know you're whenever you're writing a screenplay or um you know a, a episode of television you always have to when you get into a scene you have to set the stage um and you have to follow along you have action sequences and you have dialogue that's just like you have panels and panel descriptions and you have dialogue right. um and in terms of you know television uh most episodes of tv i i work most commonly in the one hour space so mm -hmm. most episodes of tv in the one hour space are either a five or six act structure depending on the tv show you're working on mm -hmm. and for most of the comic books that I have written so far, they have been five single issues that complete an arc. Nice. So it, it you you're I find myself almost constantly following the five act structure. And in fact, I have a story that's broken right here on my. I have a massive magnetic wall with a bunch of cards, <laughs> pretty much always stuck on it for whatever story that I'm breaking. And my daughter and I. Um, uh, Paper Cuts, which is the um, the middle grade imprint of yeah. Maverick and Mad Cave, um, they solicited a pitch for one of our ideas, and so we just broke the story. But it's it always seems to be five acts, five acts, five acts. Mm -hmm. So in that way, um, television writing and comic book writing are very very similar. And that at the mm -hmm. end of each act, at the end of each book, twenty pages, you want to have that big pivotal moment that moves the story forward, whether it's a revelation of information or, um, you know, a new twist or a new character introduced just some big or, you know, it, it really could be anything as long as it compels people to come back the next yeah. month and buy another issue. So even when I'm writing a graphic novel, um, where, you know, there are no single issues and there are no gaps in the story. Mm -hmm. I still, and the way that both volumes of Wings Were Broken were um, five five chapters, mm -hmm. so that we still had those big moments at the end. So that's the way in which it's similar. I find the biggest difference, um, and now this isn't necessary, it's, it, it just happens to be that in my experience of writing, um, I mostly write contained stories. So mm -hmm. I have not yet embarked on like a biopic, say, where I'm writing out the story of someone's entire life. Mm -hmm. Most of the stories that I write um, happen over a period of days or a month or something like that. Um, but I do find that stories move faster in comic mm -hmm. books than mm -hmm. they do um, in film and TV, at least for me. But again, that's not a prerequisite. Um, but um, there are, you know, some, it often feels like we have to take a story that could be this big and yeah. condense it for comic books. The great thing that happened um, with these Winx books is that 
the first arc that I broke for what was going to be the first volume, um, uh, uh, well, there's a couple of editors that I work with, but I was looking at them with my, you know, team of editors at uh, Maverick. And we thought, well, this is pretty big. And mm -hmm. we decided, you know what, let's not try and cram this entire arc into one book. Let's make yeah. this two. So I really did have the space to enjoy the stories. And it was wonderful because, um, you know, the, the, the pages, the, the way the book is even printed, they're right. smaller than your average book. So you can't have as many panels per page unless, and, or it becomes very, very condensed feeling. Mm -hmm. So it allowed me to breathe a lot of, um, you know, space into it with that, which was important to me because these characters are so vibrant. I inherited a whole cast of characters from this TV yeah. show and they all, and it was, two years of a show of backstory. So we've really gotten to get to know them. Mm -hmm. And so I had room to give them some side exchanges, to give Aisha some quips and jokes, to, yes. um, you know, give uh, Tara her, you know, Tara obviously is brilliant, but she she always, she always often has these moments of like, she goes a little too far or, you know, she, yeah. uh, she kind of, you know, makes an off color joke or something like that. So I was mm -hmm. able to put those things in there. Um, and of course, you know, Bloom is, poor Bloom. She's like <laughs> on the worst <laughs> teenage emotional hormonal driven ride ever. I mean, she's got yeah. so much to contend with. And I was really able to have her sit with a lot of these things that she was feeling and really experience them in the book. So um, that was, you know, normally when people ask me this question about the difference between, you know, writing for film and TV and comic mm -hmm. books, I say that, you know, these stories have to move much faster. But in terms of these Winx books, I really lucked out. And so I feel like you get a lot of the same tone, which is what one of the things that I enjoyed most about the television show is the tone. And I thought they hit it really well. I thought that the characters, I love Musa. Mm -hmm. I love how, um, how real she feels like she feels like someone I would have hung out with in college. Um, and, you know, to really get the textures of all of those characters and still maintain that the, the brooding dark quality of the show, which is what I feel like seduced, you know, so many of us that got into yes, it. Absolutely. Oh, I love that. I also love that. I mean, you know, you even mentioned how writing was always there for you, but it wasn't your main gig. And now it's, you know, it seems to be that. And what goodness, what would you say to someone that is pursuing a career as a writer or wants to get into writing professionally, you know, like what would be something that you would say to them or even advice that, you know, you wish you had, you know, starting out? Um, oh God, there's so many things. Um, well, first of all, I would say, you know, have, have something that makes money that's not writing. And, th and that, that doesn't mean that you cannot make a living as a writer, right. you can. Um, I have sometimes made a living as a writer and sometimes I haven't. It ebbs and flows. Um, so hold on to your pennies. Um, it is entirely possible. I say that because once writing is an art form mm -hmm. and you have to be able to put your heart and soul into it or what you produce we've all read and seen those things that feel like they're vanilla or cardboard. And it doesn't mean that they're not delicious. Sometimes it doesn't mean that we won't binge watch them. I, I'm, I will not name any shows because <laughs> I don't know who might be out there listening that I did that show. and know I'm never going to staff her, but I, there are some shows that I have, I have hate watched all the way through because they have great cliffhangers at the end, but the execution is like, so terrible you know what i mean and it's it's because a lot if you force yourself into a position where writing is the only way you're going to make money you are going to make certain artistic sacrifices mm. for the sake of the business that you shouldn't and it really changes the way that you create as a creator and i battle it all the time because i have i have a lot of paying projects on my plate but the they're only 
worth it if I get them done in a certain amount of time. Otherwise, yeah. okay, great. You're, you know, paying me five grand for this thing. But if it takes me six months to do it, that five mm -hmm. grand isn't going very far. Yeah. So the tendency for me is to like, okay, let me rush through this so that I can get my paycheck and move on to the next thing. But the minute you start doing that, the work really suffers. And the whole point of why we do this as artists, we exploit our own journeys as human beings in order to let other people know that they are not alone. And you cannot do that effectively if you're thinking about the money or the next gig. Yeah. So have something else that makes money so that you can take your time and put your heart and soul into your mm -hmm. projects. It's not that people might love them. People might not. It's going to happen regardless. But if you're not putting your heart and soul into your work, then you it, it, it you're only depriving yourself. And yeah. let let's face it, at, at the heart of things, we're all you know we're all self motivated individuals. It's not a bad thing to be selfish. It's actually a very good thing. Yeah. <laughs> Most of my favorite people take care of themselves first. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the first thing that I would say. And then. Um, the second thing is, you know, there's, oh, I remember when I was like going to school and beforehand, there's all this talk about the writer's voice, the writer's voice, the writer's voice. And I found, I was like, what the fuck are you talking? Oh, I'm sorry. No, you're fine. I said, you're I was fine. like, okay. No, you're perfectly fine. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm a New Yorker. So that, that's just how we say hello. Yeah. Um, I would always be like, what are they talking about? The writer's voice. I don't know what my voice is. Mm -hmm. um, so I always like to offer your voice is your unique point of view on the world. And the idea of finding your voice to me, it always seemed like, okay, well, once I found it, I found it. But no, your voice as a writer is constantly changing and shifting mm -hmm. with the experience that you gather in life. So allow yourself the fluidity to change. Also allow yourself um, the indulgence of saying like, listen, I'm I'm 16 years old and this is my experience of the world. It's, it's very limited to my house and my school and whatever, but that doesn't mean that it doesn't matter. You're, experience is valuable no matter where you come from no matter who you are we've spent a lot of time in the past few years telling certain groups of people that their voices don't matter and that they're not welcome um and that is that is arrogant and awful and i apologize to anyone who has ever been pointed at and told that they don't matter um women were told that they didn't matter for a long time and then for a fleeting second, we were told that we did matter. And a lot of us decided to tell other people that they didn't. And it was just such a strange thing that happened. Everyone's mm -hmm. voice matters. Everyone's experience matters. And um, it's important that you recognize that because your your writer's voice, all it is, is your, your unique experience of the world and how you, like no one else can, has internalized that and put it out into the world. And it can be incredibly therapeutic. So, you know, don't, don't get yourself into a place where you feel like you have nothing to say. There's always someone who could benefit from a story that you tell. Um, just, you know, um, allow yourself the space to learn how to tell stories. Don't get discouraged. Writing is so much of the, um, it's 10,000 hours, they say, isn't it? Wow. Yeah. To, to yeah. get good at something. Yeah, it's it's a 10,000 hour business. But I will tell you, once you get to the end of that 10,000 hours, you feel it. Something breaks loose and you're like, oh, this isn't hard anymore. Mm -hmm. And that's when you can take off. And it really, really is a beautiful thing. So if you feel like, you know, storytelling is, is something that you want to explore, the minute you first put pen to paper or start mm -hmm. typing, your 10,000 hours have begun. Yeah. And um, it, and none of it will be wasted. Trust me, it's it can really feel like a struggle. And sometimes you get notes and you're like, I don't know what any of this means. I, I, I don't know where to go from here. I feel totally lost. Um, find a class, talk to someone, uh, read a memoir from a writer, read a book on the craft. Um, I, I've gotten inspiration from a lot of places. Of course, I decided to get an advanced degree that I will be paying for until I die. Um, you don't have to do that. There are other ways. In fact, yeah. I'm thinking of like just putting free classes on um, Instagram again, because I'm so mad at how much I spent on my NYU education. <laughs> I'm so mad. I feel like I just want to give it all away for free. So yeah. I think I will. Um, awesome. <laughs>
<laughs> but yeah, that. so that's what I would say. There's so much that I, I, yeah. I tell newbie writers. I always, um, whenever there's like a mentorship opportunity or someone comes to me and they're like, oh, like, will you help with my class, whatever. I, I always do it because there, I have so much to say to people who <sighs> um, want to get into this. It's, it really, really is a beautiful occupation. Just don't rely on it to make you money if you, yeah. if you can. <laughs> um, and then once it takes off, just save, save, save your money. Mm -hmm. Cause you never know what it could dry up. I'm sorry. I'm not making it sound great. It, it's wonderful. It's just, yeah. yeah, it's, you have to understand the limitations. No. Yeah. And I think that, and I love that, you know, like kind of realistic perspective on it because a lot of it's, it costs you nothing to say, Oh, chase your dreams. You know, like I think that having the real life experiences and getting to share them and, you know, help, prepare creatives because every you know i firmly believe that everyone can be creative it's a muscle that you have to exercise mm -hmm. um, and you know it's but you know exercising is work and I, I feel like you know in the in creative industries it's you know just it's not sexy to say oh it's hard work but it is and thank you for you know sharing that and and sharing that advice with um, with people because the Winx fandom, you know, Fate and, and Winx Club is so creative and um, I'm excited for them to get to hear uh, this episode. But uh, before we um, take a short break um, and get into the uh, main discussion of uh, the uh, Dark Destiny, the first volume of the Fate the Winx Saga graphic novel series, um, it's become a tradition on uh, the Winx Forever podcast to do a round of rapid fire questions with our guests. So, oh my God. <laughs> okay. They are. I'm, I'm just going to remind everyone that I am very sick. <laughs> yes. So, <laughs> rapid fire is terrifying. <laughs> okay. So, but I know I'm game. I'm game. It's just that okay. my answers might be crazy because I was feverish all night long. So, let's, yes, let's do yes. it. All right. Okay. Um, so here we go. Rapid fire questions. Uh, who's your favorite Winx member? And this can oh be God, fate or, so or Winx. Fair. Um, okay. I think that, ah, uh, this is, this is tough. Initially watching the show, my favorite mm -hmm. character was Tara. I just totally fell in love with the actress. Mm -hmm. Um, I know that's going to be a controversial answer though, because she was not, a, an original <laughs> member of Wings Club. I will say though that in the writing of it, Aisha mm -hmm. very quickly became a favorite of mine too because of her candor and the jokes that she tells and the yes. way that she expresses herself and the grudges that she holds. She's a very, very dynamic <laughs> character. Yes, okay, absolutely. next. Um, if you could have an elemental power, what would it be? <sighs> oh my gosh. That's so difficult. Um, my first instinct is something like like animal based. Like I want, <laughs> <laughs> I want to have control over animals somehow. Is that elemental? Uh, it could be. Yeah, I mean that's a fairy in the original Winx Winx Club later on. So that I think that probably... I know <laughs> because I found that character hint hint for the books. Uh -huh. That's all I'm gonna say. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Um, I also then, just really want a pet raccoon, and that's the only way I can think of attracting one. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Incredible. Um, would you rather be a fairy or a specialist? Fairy. Good answer. Good answer. There's no bad answers, but that's a good answer. <laughs> Um, and then the last one, who's your favorite headmistress from Faith the Wing Saga, Rosalind or Farrah? Oh, I mean, that's really tough. I think like to hang out with Farrah, um, oh, yeah. but there's <laughs> something, I mean, I, what Rosalind did for the storyline mm -hmm. was really, really compelling. I mean, oh, yeah. what a strange and very, very multifaceted character. I would say as a character, Rosalind is much more compelling, oh, right. but I yeah. would not want to have lunch with her. <laughs> That's fair. And that was all my rapid fire questions. You did great. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Phew. Awesome. Well, we're going to take a short break. And when we come back, we are going to discuss all things Dark Destiny, Volume 1 of the Faith the Wink Saga graphic novels with Olivia Cortero Briggs. So don't go anywhere. 
If you're enjoying this episode of the Winks Forever podcast, be sure to follow the show on your preferred streaming platform so that you're notified when new episodes are released. Hey, fairy friends, Lola Valentine here. In case you missed it, the Winx Forever podcast launched our very own Discord community. Discord has been a great place to connect with so many wonderful Winxers from around the world to talk about our favorite fairies. I wanted to try and recreate the magic of the original Winx Club Online English forums from the old WinxClub.com website. So we've got forums where you can post your own topics and respond to others' posts in every Winx topic imaginable. Click the invite link in the description below to join the Winx Forever podcast Discord community. And remember, the magic's in you. And we are back with Olivia Cortero Briggs discussing Fate the Winx Saga, Volume 1, Dark Destiny, which is the graphic novel continuation of Netflix's Faith the Wink Saga coming out on July 2nd. It is available now for pre-order on Maverick Comics website. Uh, Olivia, I'm super excited to get into even more about, you know, what it, we have in store in this first volume uh, coming up. Um, I just, I want to unpack a little bit about your writing process, how you approached writing something, because like you said, you already had this world kind of handed to you and built out, um, you know, how have you been able to, you know, revisit the original mater material, you know, as you've been writing this continuation? Um, well, there were a couple challenges. First of all, it was, you know, we ended on a cliffhanger on season two. So I had to, you know, pick up that thread and mm -hmm. continue that story in the most interesting way possible. But I also wanted this book to be accessible for people who hadn't seen the show. Yeah. Um, and so how to provide enough backstory within the context of the story that I was currently telling so that anyone could just pick up the book and read it and it wouldn't feel like a bunch of you know exposition also people that did know what had happened mm -hmm. um so it was like you know trying to tell a new story with an old story mm -hmm. with a little bit of catch up um so hopefully that was done successfully but that was definitely a challenge up front but honestly it was really a lot of fun it was like okay i've watched two you know, seasons of the show. Mm -hmm. And now I get to make whatever I want happen. <laughs> it was like, it's like, you know, those dreams that you have where you go into a, a, a mall after hours, you can just like take whatever you want. I don't yeah, know if anyone yeah. has dream, but I've had that <laughs> like, you know, whatever I want to have happen here. Um, which of course, you know, as, as a creator and someone who works in television too, I'm like, you know, thinking about the people who were writing the show and I mm -hmm. hope that in some ways I, you know, um, did justice to the world that they created. And I often wonder if like, I wonder if we were going to the same place with the, yeah. with the, the show in some ways. Um, but anyway, so, so yeah, that's where it started. You know, how to make this book kind of for everyone, whether you'd seen the television show or not. Mm -hmm. And, um, and then, you know, again, there are so many rich characters in this. I had, Obviously, the first two seasons of the show had given us um, a few uh, seeds. They had planted some seeds in terms of, you know, Tara's sexual identity mm -hmm. and uh, potential love interest. And I definitely wanted to pick that up and run with it, which I did. Um, you also had Musa and Riven, uh, who seemed like they were into each other. And I knew I wanted to do something with that. <laughs> Riven is such an interesting character and i mm -hmm. i really loved him you don't often see the bad boy bisexual i in fact i don't think i've yeah. ever seen that <laughs> in a television show and i really have to commend the creators for just like going with it because it that combination just made him so hot it was like <laughs> yeah. no he's like also kind of despicable um but anyway <laughs> Um, so I wanted, yeah, so that was another thing that I knew I wanted to pick up and run with. Um, the, the romance between Bloom and Sky mm. always seemed a bit unsatisfying to me in the show and I wasn't sure why. Um, mm -hmm. so that was something that I honestly, I wanted to mess with them a bit because I feel like because the show 
it was such an obvious attraction up front and then they fall into each other i felt like okay so we're just supposed to take for granted that these two yeah um you know are together so how can i kind of poke my fingers in their eyes a bit and give them some, <laughs> give them some struggles to overcome yeah. it's very easy for them to get together in spite of the fact that like clearly stella has you know had a thing for sky for a really long time and what mm -hmm. does that mean and you know how to how to negotiate that or how stella negotiates that so um and also i loved the character of stella i think that she's incredibly complex and has a lot going on you know someone who was lying about something awful oh. that did to cover up the fact that she had lost control and the fa and that how that parallels bloom's journey of having lost control and injured her mother mm -hmm. very severely and how those stella is kind of like a shadow version of bloom in that yeah. way um she's she's kind of like bloom's dark side and i really wanted to explore that um but of course you know those are all the the characters in the periphery the main character is mm -hmm. bloom and um and bloom creates a lot of challenges as a character because i think you know a lot of the other characters and aisha included they're um they're much bigger in terms of the expressiveness of their emotions and yeah. they were given those characters were given the most obvious um uh trajectories for where they were going in terms of the season bloom didn't have that also bloom is um a lot of what she deals with is much more internal uh much deeper psychologically she's got mm -hmm. a lot going on with her that needs to be serviced but in a quieter more brooding way yeah struggle is all internal and accepting who and what she is uh is a real real challenge for her so that was obvious to me that that was her struggle throughout the series and the show that i had mm -hmm. seen so it was about how to take her identity struggle and she's constant she's almost in constant turmoil about who she is mm -hmm. she understands she's the holder of the dragon flame it's an incredibly uh important power that mm -hmm means so much to not just Althea, but you know the entirety of the other world mm -hmm. um there's an enormous amount of weight on her shoulders and it's it's almost as though she knows what she needs to be but she she's not ready to go there yet yeah. um and she's very afraid of herself um so my you know the first place that i went I trying to ignore the fact that the other characters, you know, had so much juicy stuff going on. I had to focus on Bloom first and yeah. make sure that she had an arc and a journey that was really, really compelling and then build the other character stories around that because there's always this tendency um, to make the uh, non central characters more interesting than the protagonist and uh, it and I, I, just, I, I didn't want to do that. So even though, you know, Bloom's journey is much more internal, I really tried to find a way to make it uh, compelling, even though, you know, she's not there. Yeah. For much of the book, she's not in Althea. Yeah. She's a land that you've never seen before. You know, she's gone yeah. to the realm of darkness. And, um, and so then that was, that was kind of a big job because, and it was very exciting. This realm of darkness had been talked about, but we hadn't yeah. really seen it. So how, you know, I got to basically make it whatever I wanted and decide that it was, you know, the realm of the dead. Um, I feel like the dead don't have to stay there, but it's like, it's kind of like a, like a purgatory. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, kind of create a mythos for like how, if you're not actually dead, um, what happens if you stay too long? yeah i decided it it claims you if you stay too long it claims you and you can't just go back um without the resurrection plan of course yeah um, yeah yeah definitely create problems um and of course there is a loophole but i won't tell you what that is uh but you know bloom finds herself faced with you know she's found her mom and she's living in the realm of darkness she doesn't want to leave she doesn't want to go back yeah and but everyone of course is trying to get her to go back before the window closes and she ends up being part of the realm of darkness forever yeah um and that to me seemed like a very um kind of a very 
literal and easy to dramatize way of like, do I accept my destiny or hide forever? Um, yeah. And uh, so that was, that was fun. It was fun to create that world. It was fun to create that tension for Bloom, uh, the will she, won't she mm -hmm. leave the realm of darkness and accept her destiny. Meanwhile, you know, back in Althea, um, Aisha particularly is infuriated with her oh, having yeah. left them. Um, they don't know what's happened to her, but she feels like she's chosen to stay away and she's abandoned them. And the fracture of that friendship that was very, very close um, is uh, a big driver for the two of them in their stories throughout the mm. series. That was like the basic approach to coming to it. I had all of these threads. Some of them were very, very obvious, but it was like more yeah. of like, let's ignore the obvious ones and tackle the big ones, tackle the bloom problem and then build the rest around it. Absolutely. And I love what you mentioned about, you know, hoping that you make the original, you know, creators of, of the original series proud because um, I know you've mentioned in some other interviews, like at comic cons and stuff that um, you don't have any contact with any of the original writers um, for the Netflix series. And, you know, I think how you're approaching the continuation of this, you know, um, I think it's very intriguing and, and, you know, honoring to the original characters, you know, and their intentions, whatever, you know, whatever they were. I think that um, see, seeing it live on and live, live past, you know, even, you know, once you put it out into the world, it's, it's everyone's now, you know, and so that's, that's exciting. Um, that's exciting to see. So, well, I know that you've mentioned before um, wanting to focus on the characters in you know in the stories that are already present without introducing really any new other characters you know into the graphic novels um but does this mean that we won't be seeing an introduction of a certain fairy of technology <laughs> of techna um that is one that fans you will have to take up with rainbow <laughs> all right all right <laughs> um there i would say without saying too much there have been attempts, attempts okay. denied. Okay. So we, yeah, at this, in terms of bringing over fairies from Winx Club in, mm -hmm. into uh, the new iteration of Fate the Winx Saga, I don't know how much of that we'll be able to do. What that does, however, open the door for is for me to create. Yes. Characters. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and which and there are some new characters that you haven't seen before um mm -hmm. in these books um we ooh, one <gasps> is from faith the wing saga <laughs> is it like it's maybe impossible that they didn't catch this but now i'm like i'm, I'm putting my cards out there but um <laughs> you are going to meet um a a, a big nemesis um, right. There's, there, there's right. a big bad guy that I did <gasps> take from uh, from Winx Club, okay. and took him in and like you know, revamped him, um, mm -hmm. and I didn't get pegged for that. So I get I don't know maybe it just it's the it's the Winx Club fairies themselves yeah. the ones that have not yet appeared in Fate the Winx Saga that Rainbow doesn't want us to use. I'm not quite sure. I, mm -hmm. I'm not I don't know how all of that works, but there are a couple new characters that I have created. Um, and obviously like a whole host of background characters, but um, yeah, there is definitely one big bad that is coming <laughs> from Wings Club. Like, okay. Yeah, I see a new iteration of. That's super exciting. Okay. Well, I, I respect that. Yeah. Just, you probably man, petition Rainbow. I, I, I don't know what it takes, but okay. you know, I'm, <laughs> I, I, I love our licensure, by the way. Rainbow has really yeah. been fantastic to us. And um they they only they don't give any superfluous notes and i am so grateful for that so i i, I adore them but i will also tell you to heckle them uh because i would love i would love to bring techna back yes. um and she's not the only one mm -hmm. um yeah. i would love to reinvent them um i actually although fans might want to kill me for this but i was thinking about like kind of making her like a bit of a bad fairy like she's kind of dangerous I that's that's the direction that I wanted to go in but I was I, I they didn't let me so oh, yeah. fans go for it um, do it do no, it no, for no. me let's see if we can let's see if we can turn that no into a yes yeah as Absolutely. of now no I I'm I'm sad to say but yeah. there's lots of other really, really fun things for fans and Easter eggs and juicy tidbits. So I, I yeah. hope I made up for it. 
Incredible. Um, I know you've mentioned, you know, rewatching Fate, um, you know, to kind of help in your writing process. Um, have you rewatched the original Winx Club at all? No. And I kind of did that on purpose. Um, Okay. I did read, I, uh, Maverick re-released the Mm -hmm. original comics, um, Yeah. uh, that I think were originally came out in Italian. Um, and I read those, but I did not watch the animated series. Cause again, you know, you're, I really wanted to, the, again, what was so seductive to me about fate, the Winx saga and what differentiates fate from Winx club is the tone, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I really wanted to stay immersed in that tone. And so I even like, I created a playlist for myself using a lot of the score that was used in the television show and then other things that were associated with it and Spotify is so amazing. I love suggestions. Uh Um, So anytime that I was right, like breaking story or writing the scripts, I was listening Mm -hmm. to that music because the tone is so specific and I really, really wanted to capture it. And, you know, as a creator, you have to, um, there's a tendency to do too much research, right? You want to Mm -hmm. uh, do homage to the whole thing. So you just like pile all of this information into your brain. And then before you know it, it's so crowded in there that where are your thoughts, right? Yeah. Wings club thoughts and I have fate wings thoughts (laughs) and I have all these influences, but what are mine? Mm -hmm. Um, So yeah, so I, I, I read the books, but I did not watch series. I have not yet. I, I think it's, I just finished, actually, I literally, like, two days ago, I sent in the final revision for the second volume. So it might be Ooh. safe for me now. <laughs> uh, I have a bit of a break. Hopefully, it's just a break. I would love to keep writing these books. Um, yeah. But the first two volumes, for me, are Absolutely. in the can. Really cool. Did you ever um, get to check out or read the, and, you know, this might this might have also been, you know, in the realm of too much research, but there was also the Fate tie-in novels by uh, Sarah Reese Brennan. No, um, I didn't know that. that. Yeah, so um, Sarah Reese Brennan, she is funny enough an Irish author um, that was able to work on the Netflix property uh, Sabrina, the Chilean Adventures of Sabrina for those tie-in novels, and then was given the opportunity to um, do a couple of tie-in novels for Fate. Um, so it was really interesting. I got to also interview her. So this is so fun to get to like the the published version of Fate, like getting to interview um, the authors is just wonderful. Um, but yeah, so so the, those exist. Um, it's 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 an interesting take because also it's a lot of you know it's a, lot, it's a lot of what you're talking about of like you know getting to know these characters and how they think and feel, you know, and um, I'm really excited to see what you, what you do with them in, um, in this first volume. Speaking of which, and I know we've talked about it, um, the massive cliffhangers, right. And, and kind of your approach to tying up those loose ends before we can kind of go on any other adventures. And I love what you said about how, you know, this for you guys, this is not an end. This is, a you basically just a new beginning (laughs) which is really exciting um and you know wanting to continue it on past just these two novels uh what are you looking forward to the fans experiencing with these first two novels um a lot (laughs) uh i mean really i want those um and, and and this is in no particular order, but I wanted people who were big fans of the, you know, uh, Fate Saga to be able to, to get back into that feeling again. Because again, mm-hmm. what I was mentioning about tone, like that was what was so seductive about the show is getting to hang out in this world, in this school. Yeah. Um, and there's something I think, why is there something so satisfying about a school where like the teachers and administration are like pretty ineffectual like it, it always felt like kids ran the joint to me yeah. and it's like it's so satisfying that like it doesn't matter how like awesome silva is like the the, mm-hmm. the wings sweet they're more powerful than anybody yeah. um so uh yeah that was something very satisfying so I, honestly getting to um, dive into the story when there's no headmistress and things are just like kind of in chaos and <laughs> Um, Silva's like doing his best, but really Aisha is running the place when, when it's part, which I love, yeah. um, was, uh, was, was really, really fun. And now I'm like forgetting the basis of the question. Cause I just, Oh, you're off. good. Just, yeah. What are, what are you excited for fans to experience? Yeah, right. Okay. <laughs> so yeah. yes, I'm excited for, um, for fans to get to get back into that, that tone in that world and hang out with their friends again. 
um, because we really did feel like uh, we knew these characters. I'm also excited um, for fans to get to see some of the choices that I, I made some big choices. Um, there were a lot of questions hanging out there that I was like, you know what, I'm just gonna answer this. Like, who is Bloom's birth mother? That question gets answered. Um, uh, the, also, who's related to who? Um, <laughs> There's, uh, it was the end of season two where they were talking about, um, was it the Sisters Three? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So a powerful triad, yeah. So you get to find out who that is. All right. Um, uh, again, we have a big bad that was brought over from uh, Winx Club, who I've reinvented, um, and how, and yeah, he's he's making his bid um, oh. to take over and come back to the come back to the other world and how that manifests. I'm excited. I, I've come up with a new creature, <gasps> the mythology behind that creature. Um, we have a brand new type of fairy who we may have talked about earlier. Oh, right. All right. Um, <laughs> but there was also, I also took a big swing in terms of um, the, uh, how Stella's powers manifest in this. And, mm -hmm. um, I, it's so hard to not say too much, <laughs> but um, like what I was talking about before with uh, Bloom, how her struggle is one of identity mm -hmm. and understanding who she's supposed to be, but not feeling ready. But is that really who I am? Who do mm -hmm. I want to be battling expectations? The reason why I gravitated so much towards that is that I feel like, and this this is not just for women i'm just talking about my own experience here yeah. but i feel like so often women especially women my age are we find ourselves torn between so many expectations so that identity crisis with bloom i just i felt it so hard and i mm -hmm. i went at it in the most dramatic way that i could think of the most visually compelling dramatic way yeah which literally by the end of volume two almost the mm -hmm. end of volume two has to come face to face with herself mm -hmm. um and which and you'll see how that manifests but um but that was a big exciting swing that i took how and again i don't want to tell you specifically what it is but <laughs> how that identity crisis manifests mm -hmm. and it manifests between two characters between bloom and stella mm -hmm. and um I was very, very excited about that choice. So yes. I, I'm really hoping that fans love it. Yeah. Uh, and then, yeah, the um, there's, everyone knows that a Tara cat romance is gonna happen. Mm -hmm. That was also something I put a lot of myself into. Um, I had uh, just gotten into a new partnership. I was recently divorced and stumbled upon the love of my life. And we had a lot of issues in the mm -hmm. beginning. And it's so hard to reconcile when you feel like you love someone like you've never loved someone before and yet you keep having these problems. Mm -hmm. And so I took one of the problems that we were dealing with and I gave it to them. Wow. And, uh, it to, to it because I have to personalize these things for myself. Mm -hmm. And I let them wrestle with it and, and saw what happened. And um, it was uh, tragic and beautiful. And I'm, I'm hoping that fans enjoy that too. There's a lot. Yeah. I mean, I could, I, I could go on, but I, I would say <laughs> that like, <laughs> I always, whatever, I, I always take what I'm currently dealing with and, mm -hmm. and give it to my characters. It's very cathartic. And so yeah. even though this was a licensed project and even though, you know, I often wondered, okay, you know, what would the creators of this think of the choices that I'm making? Yeah just like every other book that I write, just like every creator owned book that comes straight from my brain. Mm -hmm. I made this just as personal as any book that oh. I have written. I love that. And I think that, I mean, as a fan, like I couldn't have asked, you know, for, for anything better like that, you know, is what we hope happens, you know, to a property that is loved and endeared by so many people. Um, to it for it to you know fall in the hands of someone that is going to give it that attention and you know and care is really encouraging and we are so excited for the release um and is available for pre-order olivia thank you so incredibly much for just you know taking the time to talk with me today and um just to give us a little insight before we get to dive into this world for ourselves um where can our listeners find you and your work online 
I am at Olivia C. Briggs on Instagram. That's the best place to get me. Um, if you message me, I always check my messages, even when they're in the little request columns. So I will find your message and I always try to respond. So that's the best place to get to me. And um, we should do this again once the books are out. because Then oh. I can actually talk about things. <gasps> that would be great. It's, first book. Um, it's just, it's, it, the, the dance is so hard. And like every time I'm at these like comic cons, the, you know, people from uh, Maverick are like sitting right in the front and I'm like, yes. Um, but no this was lovely thank you so much and thank you for being a fan um thank you for embracing all the different facets of wings i know it's it's hard for folks um just know that you know for all of you wings club fans out there who feel like this whole thing is just a complete bastardization of the (laughs) the characters in the story you love just know that you know the creators that um, have been tasked with reinventing this property um, really do love it. I guess I can't speak for everyone, but I can speak for Christiane and myself um, Mm -hmm. that we have really put our heart and soul into this. So um, whether you love it or hate it, it's totally fine, but just uh, please, please know that we tried. Yeah, no, and- And I'm so scared of the release of this book. I'm very excited, but I'm very scared. Yeah, well, congratulations. Super looking forward to it. And thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks so much for listening. If you enjoyed this episode of the Winx Forever podcast, be sure to follow on your preferred streaming platform so that you're notified when new episodes drop. The theme for the Winx Forever podcast is the song She Makes Magic by Big Wild. Wild.